1.7 million square feet, a capacity of about 60,000 screaming fans, that's the plan for the Tennessee Titans' new stadium in the heart of Nashville. It's projected to cost $2.1 billion, and more than half will come directly from taxpayers. The over $1 billion price tag is the most public money ever committed to an NFL stadium, beating out the previous record of $850 million set by New York State and the Buffalo Bills just a year prior. Since 2000, subsidies for financing major pro sports venues have cost taxpayers an estimated $4.3 billion. As 75% of new stadiums built were backed by tax-exempt municipal bonds. And NFL stadiums are some of the most expensive facilities in the world. It's also America's most profitable league. The benefit is really for the community and the opportunity it provides for locals being a major league sports town may have indirect uh, linkages to an economic and fiscal benefit. While the NFL and team owners estimate that building stadiums will provide economic growth for a city, economists and urban planners think otherwise. So we're talking about a ton of money being used, usually across the, the country. It, it doesn't go to a vote. It's it's really, it's you know, if the mayor or the city council wants to spend these hundreds of millions or you know, potentially even to billions of dollars. We now have a lot of empirical evidence, a lot of studies that show that investing in stadiums is not the best idea. It doesn't give you the best return on investment. Lenders may perceive bonds for a stadium as pretty low risk because the stadium is guaranteed to generate revenue because football is cartel. <laughs> it's not going to go out of business anytime soon. It all begins with the issuing of tax-exempt bonds from state and local governments that the federal government has signed off on for decades. These tax exemptions help lower the burden of high debt through low-interest municipal bonds used by cities and teams to pay for stadiums. Since 1913, municipal bonds were a popular financing option for things like airports, roads, hospitals, and schools. Private entities had access to public bonds, but were subject to a volume cap that limits how much public bonds are issued per year. As for stadiums, well, they weren't subject to that cap. But fast forward to the 1980s, we arrive at the Tax Reform Act of 1986. The bill wanted to end tax exemptions for private use, including stadiums. Instead, the bill inadvertently created a loophole, allowing stadiums to be backed by tax-free public bonds. So how does this loophole even work? In order for stadiums to be exempt from federal taxation, they must fail one of two tests. There's the private use case test, which boils down to no more than 10% of the money from the bond is being used by a private entity. NFL teams will certainly pass this since pro teams would use more than 10% of that bond money. Then there's the private payment test, also known as the 10% loophole. That test states that no more than 10% of the bond's debt service is backed by the stadium itself. So if a state or local government is willing to finance at least 90% of the stadium bond, it fails the private payment test meaning the stadium will get tax-exempting finance through public bonds. In order to keep that tax exemption, repayment of the bond cannot come directly from revenues generated from the stadium or rent collection. Instead, cities rely on taxes like hotel taxes to pay off these bonds through tourism. Of course, that works differently depending on how many tourists the city attracts. Even how things are set up varies from team to team. Just take Las Vegas and Chicago. The stadium authority actually owns the stadium. Um, the benefit of the stadium is actually to, to the Raiders. Uh, we lease the stadium to the Raiders for no cost. Um, so the, the, the basic concept was they're going to put a $1.25 billion into that stadium and they are going to get the direct economic benefit of that stadium. The public through the room tax is going to put in 750 million. A lot of times the argument is, well, you you also get exposure. You know, these uh, Monday night football shots looking over Chicago skyline uh, will encourage people to come and visit. And there's really no way to, to quantify if that's actually occurring. You know, you can't go out and ask everybody on the street who comes to visit Chicago if they came because they saw us on Sunday night football. The 90s became a free for all for this loophole and the moniker of stadium mania was created for this sports era. Pro leagues and even colleges began using public funds for venues. The NFL saw major shakeups in the 90s and early aughts. New NFL teams were added with stadiums mostly paid for by the public. Some teams moved to cities completely rebranding or rebooting franchises. And as the dust settled, during the height of stadium mania, the NFL saw four teams move cities, four new teams added to the league, all of which were awarded new, mostly publicly funded stadiums. 
Stadium mania got so out of control that a bill was introduced to Congress known as the Stadium Financing and Franchise Relocation Act of 1999 to combat team's leverage on its home city. But that bill never came to law. It's clear that stadiums are largely paid for by taxpayers and local governments, and these bonds can't be paid back directly from what the stadiums generate, so the cities are left to their own devices. And it may come as no surprise that NFL teams make hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue each year. The NFL is a privately owned organization consisting of 32 teams. Revenues for each team is split into two groups, national and local revenue. National revenue is the money that the NFL generates yearly from things like media rights, licensing, brand deals, and sponsorships. That money is split evenly among all 32 teams. Local revenue varies from team to team, but it's the money that the team generates from ticket sales, concessions, licensing, team sponsorships, and even naming rights. One team, the Green Bay Packers, is publicly owned and provides some insight to how the money flows for the NFL. The Packers got $347 million from the NFL for national revenue in 2021. Multiply that by 32 teams, and you get $11.1 billion for the entire league. For local revenue from things like ticket sales from hosting 620,000 fans and a stock sale in 2021, the Packers made an estimated $231.7 million in that year. Though there are over half a million shareholders, Packers stock has no monetary value. It doesn't pay dividends, nor can be sold. Yet $64.7 million was generated by funding from newly deployed stocks to fans. These stock sales allowed the organization to reinvest in its stadium. The Packers are uniquely positioned compared to the rest of the league. Since they're a non-profit publicly owned team, they can rely on things like shareholder funding to afford upgrades or renovations that the stadium might need. As for the other 31 teams, they either rely on private funding or like most cases, public funds. And in rare cases, when a team and a city don't see eye to eye, a team could just move to a new city willing to foot the bill. Hill is the chairman of the Las Vegas Stadium Authority and was an integral part of facilitating the deal that moved the Raiders from Oakland to Las Vegas in the nearly $2 billion Allegiant Stadium. From our standpoint, I think it's only leverage if you allow it to be. Um, you know, one of our principles going into this is don't fall in love with the deal. Um, it's got to work for both sides. All, all deals should. Um, and so uh, from a leverage standpoint, I, I, we didn't really look at it that way. We felt like uh, we could probably structure a deal that would work for the Raiders and the NFL as well as Las Vegas and the state of Nevada. And we feel like we certainly did that um, and felt also that if we couldn't do that, we shouldn't move forward. It, it, it wouldn't ultimately work for everybody involved. Teams are valued anywhere from $2.8 to $7.6 billion and bring at least $200 million annually, which begs the question, why do multi-billion dollar NFL teams need public funds for new stadiums? And do the home cities reap any of the rewards? Spillover gains is the idea that stadiums create an indirect positive economic impact. These gains are difficult to track and vary from city to city and case by case. In a comment to CNBC, the NFL stated, private-public partnerships have worked well for decades as a vehicle to build multi-use community stadiums. We understand that these are difficult decisions for communities and leaders and appreciate the support. In the case of Las Vegas, the government is better positioned to recoup its municipal bond commitment as Las Vegas is one of America's biggest tourism hubs. We're collecting about 50 million additional dollars through a rim taxes. That's largely paid for by tourists, almost completely paid for by tourists. Um, but the real key there is um, the stadium itself is producing more tax revenue than the $50 million. It's turned out to be probably double uh, the 50 million. And that comes in the form of live entertainment tax, a ticket tax, um, sales tax on everything sold around there, uh, modified business tax, which is a payroll tax, all of those types of taxes then are into their typical flow and used in their typical way um, to provide services throughout Nevada. The spillover gains Hill is referring to are unique to not only just the NFL, but all of pro sports. Over 20 years of research studies have found that stadiums are costly and show little to no evidence that gains outweigh the potential tax burden for the city and its people. You'll at least like get the new stadium and you'll get like whatever other economic activity spins off the stadium and then the stadium pays for itself using 
these sales taxes that have come in otherwise. But that is only true if you accept that the land that the stadium is on and the borrowing capacity used to raise the money to build the stadium, that it, if you accept that that could not have been done for any other possible land use other than a stadium. And that's just clearly not true. Just take Chicago's Soldier Field, for example. In 2001, Soldier Field needed massive upgrades for its aging stadium built in the 1920s. Beautiful old stadium, just not functional for the modern NFL. The powers of B, Mayor Daly, he was a big, big idea guy, but also a big uh, deferred payment sort of guy. Um, yeah, he, he signed us up for 30 year bond obligation. And we actually currently owe more than the original uh, project was estimated to, to cost. Renovation costs were $587 million. $200 million in funding came directly from the NFL and the Chicago Bears. The remaining $387 million was financed through public municipal bonds, all of which were backed by increased tourism taxes on Chicago's hotels. The city now owes $640 million on that initial $387 million bond. But what about the money generated by the team? Well, since funds generated by the stadiums can't be utilized to pay back bonds, the local revenue an NFL team earns in the given season goes straight back to the organization. Public funds diverted to multi-billion dollar teams make little sense in the long run to a city. Yet cities continue to shell out hundreds of millions of dollars for teams. In 2021, rumors spread that the Buffalo Bills threatened to move the organization to Austin, Texas, if the team didn't receive public funding for a new stadium. Well, the team didn't move, and it's going to cost the city $850 million in public money diverted to Orchard Park Stadium in New York. For perspective, Orchard Park's per capita income is $49,000 per year. Nashville, Tennessee has received the most public funding to date. $1.26 billion of the estimated $2.1 billion will come directly from public funding. And Nashville's per capita income was over $36,000 per year. The 10% loophole has been widely criticized. The NFL, the most profitable and popular sports league in the US, has garnered the most attention. I, I think every city could potentially brainstorm other possible land uses that can go on a space that that are in demand and that and that there's a market for <laughs> and and that it, it doesn't have to be sports. Reducing or completely eliminating the use of public funds for stadiums has become an increasingly bipartisan issue. Since 2015, both Republicans and Democrats have expressed their shared interest in closing the loophole. In 2015, the Obama administration proposed removing the 10% loophole for sports and other private projects. In 2017, Democrat and Republican Senators Cory Booker and James Lankford introduced a bill outlawing the use of tax-exempt bonds for any pro-sports venues. That same year, the Trump administration proposed eliminating the tax-exempt bonds for NFL stadiums through the administration's tax reform bill. Most recently in 2022, Oregon Representative Earl Blumenauer introduced a new bill called the No Tax Subsidies for Stadiums Act of 2022. Yet no progress has been made on that bill. I think this is something that state and local governments also need to be taking a look at because especially for a team that serves like multiple local jurisdictions, the team can, without leaving their market and without leaving their particular region, they can still try to pit local jurisdictions against each other in a bidding war over the exact location of a stadium within a region. And that is really a race to the bottom that needs to stop. As for how fans feel regarding this issue, most just want to ensure that their teams stay put. Protests from fans have erupted over the years when other cities have drawn their teams away from them. NFL teams and their fan bases are linked by a shared identity, and a team can reflect the city's persona. Diehard fans from all 32 teams will continue to fight hard to make sure that their teams stay in their hometowns, even if that means they have to foot the bill.